basically this film looks like ordinary window film, but what's inside of it are nanoparticles. And these particles have a natural tendency to be in a random position. But as soon as you apply an electric voltage, these particles will line up and allow light to pass through. And then when you remove the voltage, it'll go back to a random position and block light. Hey everyone, welcome to It's a Material World. We're the show that uncovers why material science will change the world. Consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. It would really help us out. Before the episode today, I just want to introduce our sponsors. Today's sponsor is Johnson Matthews, a global leader in sustainable technology. Johnson Matthews' vision is for a world that's cleaner and healthier today and for future generations. Johnson Matthews scientists use their deep understanding of materials, surface science, chemistry, and chemical engineering to design catalysts, advanced materials, and processes, all which tackle the world's biggest challenges. These include the energy transition, including a transition to a hydrogen economy, the mobility transition towards battery electric and fuel cell cars and trucks, and the development of low carbon emitting technologies. Johnson Matthey is developing battery materials for EV applications and also manufactures advanced glass materials, so it's great to have them sponsor this podcast. Johnson Matthey, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Joe Hereri, who has been the CEO of Research Frontiers for the past three decades. Research Frontiers has been on the cutting edge of smart glass technology, having applications in automotives, architecture, trains, aircrafts, and more. So thank you so much, Joe, for joining us today. A pleasure, Paneeth and David. Uh, you make me sound old when you said I've been uh, involved with this for 30 <laughs> years, because it seems like yesterday that we started. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, so for, I guess, to start off, uh, for our listeners out there who may not know exactly what smart glass is, could you kind of explain the basics of what is classified as a smart glass? Sure, so smart glass basically has the ability to change the tint electrically. And if you've been in a Mercedes or a McLaren or the new Cadillac that's coming out uh, or in some buildings or in some aircraft, you might've seen that the glass has the ability to change its tint instantly and to any level you desire. And the way we do that is with nanotechnology. So basically it's material science on steroids here. And I brought a piece of this film Basically, this film looks like ordinary window film, but what's inside of it are nanoparticles. And these particles have a natural tendency to be in a random position. But as soon as you apply an electric voltage, these particles will line up and allow light to pass through. And then when you remove the voltage, it'll go back to a random position and block light. So we're simply moving these nanoparticles inside this film to be able to vary the tint in glass. And you know, if you want to get down into what the materials are, you have these polyiodide crystals that are very, very efficient at blocking and controlling light, and that will react to an electric field. And you have some polymers that are used to suspend these nanoparticles in capsules inside the film. And then you have a silicone based film that gets simply sold in rolls and laminated to glass or plastic whenever it's needed. Uh, to make it into a smart window. Interesting. So to get more into, I guess, the basics. So it's amorphous, similar to any general glasses that the random orientation and then applying in electric field makes it so that it looks more like a crystal structure in a way where it blocks light. Is that understanding correct? What's really happening is that the natural tendency is for them to look in a random position where they're blocking light. And then as soon as you aligned, uh, you apply a small electric voltage, the particles will line up perpendicular to the window. And because there's a very small aspect ratio that's there to block light, you're allowed to allow light to pass through. So to put it simply, if you want to allow light to come into a window or more light, you apply a very, very small voltage. How small? 0 0.06 watts per square foot. So we had this in the world's fair, a 10,000 square foot roof. And in the dark state, it used no power. In a semi-tinted state, it used about the same power as three light bulbs. And in a fully clear state, it used the power of maybe five light bulbs. And that's over a 10,000 square feet of glass. So you're using very, very small amounts of power. And it's very efficient because 
you're bringing in daylight and illumination and you don't have to use electricity at the illumination level. So you're saving a substantial amount of power and reducing the carbon footprint of your homes, your offices, your, uh, your uh, vehicles by doing this. So it's, who would have thought that glass can have such a meaningful impact, but there's so many benefits once they started using this. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. And we'll definitely dive into those various applications later on, but for now, can you tell us what makes your SPD smart glass different from other products that are in the same market? Sure. So um, there's two other types of smart glass technology that are either have been out there or are being introduced now. One is called PDLC or polymer dispersed liquid crystal. And that's been around for about 40 years. It's very good for privacy. And you might've seen glass that goes from clear to a frosty white. And uh, that'll achieve privacy by scattering an image. However, it doesn't block light. So you don't really get the solar benefits of, uh, you know, of a shade. And then you have electrochromatic technology and maybe the most common use of this is sometimes on rearview mirrors of cars, you will see a mirror that will darken when someone comes up behind you with their lights on. And that's using an electrochemical reaction in something like tungsten oxide to create a color change. The issue with electrochromatic or electrochemical glass is that like any electrochemical reaction, it's slow. So it may take 20 or 40 minutes for a window to switch uh, with an electrochromic glass. And it's not very uniform. And you, used to, you have to use high current to create a electrochemical reaction. You know, for people that have a cell phone, you know that on day one, when you buy a cell phone, the battery is pretty good. A year from now, it's not so good. And that's an electrochemical reaction that's going on very similar to what goes on inside of this electrochemical glass that is out there. So we do something much different. We don't have any electrochemical reactions. So we've done 30 million, 35 million on off switches without any change in performance. So it doesn't get tired. Um, it's very fast. So whether you're doing something the size of a small aircraft window or a huge window in a commercial building, it's going to switch in two seconds. So we don't have the size uh, and the slowness that they um, uh, that they have with electrochromics. And that's basically a survey of what's out there. So one is very good for privacy. One is very slow. And then there's us, which is good for privacy and very fast. So we're kind of like the highest performing smart glass out there. Awesome. Yeah. So after some research, we found that the primary use of your smart glass is in cars, yes. where for an increase in price, it can replace normal sunroofs or windows, for example. If I was a consumer, why should I want your smart glass? Exactly. And exactly. what are the benefits for both me and the environment? Um, let's start with the question, what's in it for you? Okay, that's always a good place to start. If you put our glass in your car, you're gonna gain about two to three inches of headroom because you're eliminating the pull across shade with glass that actually is much more effective at blocking heat, light, and glare. So you're gonna get extra headroom without having to raise the roof to a higher level and compromise your stability. Because once you raise um, the roof of the car, you're lowering, you're raising the center of gravity and making it less stable. So we can actually lower the center of gravity on any car by using this technology. The other thing is we're blocking about 18 degrees of heat that's coming in. So I grew up in Florida where you'd park your car at the beach for two hours and you wouldn't be able to sit in it. Imagine instead of getting into the car and it being 90 degrees, it's 72 degrees and you haven't used your air conditioning. So the benefit there is that, first of all, you can make your air conditioning compressors in your cars 40% smaller. So you have more room in the car. Because it's lighter and smaller, you're dragging along less weight. So you're actually making the car more energy efficient. And because you're using the air conditioner less because you're already starting with a temperature that's 18 degrees cooler, for most cars, you're saving about four grams per kilometer in CO2 emissions, which is huge. In Europe, four grams per kilometer would cause uh, car makers to have a penalty of about $400 per car. So we're eliminating that penalty. And if you put it in an electric vehicle, you're actually increasing the driving range by about five and a half percent, which is 
enormous because if you think about what the trends are in electric vehicles, first of all, they're not just Teslas anymore, but virtually every major car company in the world has announced that they're going all electric. Mm -hmm. uh, some are going all electric by 2025, some are going all electric by 2030, but there's definitely a very pronounced move towards electric vehicles. Battery technology really hasn't caught up with the needs of the consumer. You know, people have range anxiety when they, they get in a car. How far will it go and will I get stuck? Now, of course, the more you introduce more charging stations and things like that, the less there's that anxiety. But right now, battery technology is not advancing as fast as the consumer needs. So you really have to focus on conservation and using the energy more efficiently. And that's where our glass comes in because it allows you to have more of your battery power go towards driving the car and less towards cooling it. And that allows you to have the cars go for further. Wow, that's crazy how something so simple with just adjusting the light and being able to save so much energy really leads to that drastic of a difference in EV range as well as CO2 emission reductions. And you were talking about battery technology and that's something David and I have talked about in the past extensively. And I know he's very passionate about it. I've done research on it. So there definitely seems to be a lot of room for improvement and it's a very growing field at the moment. So that's all crazy. Right. And, and these are mutually exclusive endeavors. If you're trying to make electric vehicles better, of course, you're going to focus on the battery, but you're also going to focus on the charging architecture and you're going to focus on the conservation of energy. And that's where we come in, in the conservation of energy. So th these are all very symbiotic types of things that where material science can really have a, a major impact on you know, how we live and how we get from place to place. Mm, interesting. So it's a two, two facet idea there where it's saving energy, but also increasing battery technology, improving it to right. um, increase that range. Got it. That's interesting. Right now. Now, other benefits is you're more comfortable. You're saving energy. You're driving further on a tank of gas or on a, on a charge in your battery. Uh, you're having a more stable and comfortable car. And as we move towards a world where cars are driving themselves more, the autonomous vehicles, uh, it becomes even more useful. And autonomous vehicles are not science fiction. If you've ever been in anything that moves that you're not driving, you sort of have been in an autonomous vehicle. So think about a train, a taxi, an airplane. Um, you're not driving them typically. And because of that, you're either looking out the window, looking at your device or watching a movie. Well, each of those scenarios would require glass to be in a different tint. So now all of a sudden, the glass is working with you because you can control it. So when Cadillac just came out with their new flagship electric vehicle called the Celestique, it was announced at CES this past year they basically configured our glass to be able to be controlled in four separate sections. So if you want your glass above your head to be dark and I want it light because I'm driving and I want to be awake and you're in the back and you're, you know, watching a movie or, you know, checking your email, we could both have what we want. So you could actually wow. give passengers more control with that. So you have these abilities. And as you move towards an autonomous driven world, those things become more important. Mm -hmm. you know, because you're not driving the car. So you may want to look out the window mm -hmm. or you may want to check your email. And both of those would require the glass to be in a different state. And that's where we come in. And that could be manual. You could flip a switch and do it. It could be automatic. You hook it up to a photo cell and it'll automatically detect lighting conditions and adjust the glass. You can talk to your glass. People think I'm crazy when I walk through my office <laughs> and I'm talking to the windows <laughs> in my office with an Amazon Alexa and telling them to go on or off. And it's that simple. Yeah, that's really cool to see that Cadillac wants to use it. I guess kind of as you've marketed this out, what type of response from the public have you gotten for the glass? Well, when we first started this company, Research Frontiers, Smart Windows with Science Fiction, uh, I think there was a smart window in the movie Blade Runner and a couple of other you know, limited instances. Now it's commonplace due to the fact that if you set your mind to creating the future, you can do it and with determination and some smart people. And we were very blessed with both 
determination and some very smart scientists uh, to do that. So I encourage anybody listening, go into science and change the world, okay? You can do that. Um, but uh, one of the challenges that we had in the beginning was just getting it to work on a large scale because there's many, many things that will work on a lab scale that won't work in commercial production. Then we had to basically introduce it in a way where once we got it out of the lab and into the real world, it would be feasible and effective. So we constantly are working on making the performance better and the, reducing the costs. And if you look at the costs that Mercedes paid for the first class versus <laughs> even two years or three years later, it was half the price. Wow. And it's gone even lower since then because we've now really focused on cost reductions for the technology. So one of the big challenges was getting the technology to be affordable because we want it used everywhere. And you know, as an exercise, next time you go outside, look at all the places that glass is. And you'll see that you can change your view of the world everywhere you look. And that's, our, that's one of our mottos, change your view of the world everywhere you look. Right, wow, that's awesome. So also the other part of R&D, I'm guessing is automating it and maybe you know attaching photo cells and things of that nature to your technology. How exactly does that work? Yeah, well, fortunately, our technology is very um, robust and forgiving. So mm -hmm. you could use off the shelf components, a smart plug, for example, you know, you get an Amazon Alexa and a smart plug and you're in business talking to your windows. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's not, it, it's not something that required a lot of specialized effort. Of course, if you're designing an energy efficient window and you pay attention to the electronics, that's where most of the energy is actually being dissipated is in the electronics, the, you know, the dimmer switch on your wall. Our glass acts as a perfect capacitor. So we're using very, very little energy to power our glass. And you know, focusing on the electronics and the uh, energy efficiency of them is a way to really make these windows super energy efficient. Wow. Cool. So transitioning over to another application in previous conversations and earlier in this discussion, you mentioned architecture as potentially the second largest use with your smart glass. So why exactly would architects or companies choose to build with your smart glass for their headquarters or their large structures? Okay. So think about any building that you've been in with a beautiful view. I will almost guarantee you that the window shades or vertical shades that are wide open and there's oppressive heat coming into that building because they're, they wanna preserve the view. They don't wanna block it, okay? And up until now, up until our glass, you had to either make a compromise. You either had to block the view and block the heat and light or open it up and allow oppressive heat, light and glare into the building. Now you could simply tune the tint of your glass. So you're not blocking the view, but you're controlling to your heart's desire what type of um, lighting conditions you're gonna have inside. So now let's take a typical building. Uh, in New York, where we're headquartered, it's very hot in July and August. It's not so hot the rest of the year, but when you build a skyscraper in New York, you're designing the HVAC systems to be to keep com uh, occupants comfortable in July and August. So that means for 10 months out of the year, your mechanical rooms are working at about 30% efficiency. So you're just wasting a lot of energy that way. The windows themselves are about 18 to 20% of a building's energy footprint. You're wasting energy. Maybe a third of the energy gets wasted usually through a window. So we can cut that down tremendously. So less wastage outside the window. And then, Remember I said it takes very little power to clear up our glass? You could actually bring in daylighting into a building more effectively and for less power. So if you're trying to achieve any given lighting level, during the day, it's gonna be a lot less costly, and a lot more energy efficient to basically clear up our windows because we're using such little power to bring daylighting in. So what does that mean numerically? Windows are 18 to 20% of a building's energy footprint. Illumination besides the cost of the hardware to install lighting and things like that, it's about 25 to 30% of a building's energy footprint is being wasted with illumination. 
And then you have also this right size mechanical rooms, which will make your equipment run more effectively. So you're reducing energy costs there, but also you have more rentable space if you're a landlord because your mechanical rooms don't have to be designed for July and August. The windows are gonna do the heavy lifting there, are gonna do the work. So if I was an architect, I wanted an energy efficient green building. I wanted low carbon emissions. You definitely want to use this glass. And if you have occupants that love their views and are paying a premium for them, you absolutely must have this glass because it allows you to preserve your view yet control the heat light and glare coming into your building. Yeah, that's awesome. I didn't know that it would save so much energy. That would be really huge for green buildings with like lead certification, for example. Right. Uh, you kind of talked about this before with the cost, but through our past research and classes, we've seen the most common challenges for any technology, uh, for any nanotechnology, uh, would be the cost of large scale manufacturing and also uh, complexities with processing. How does Research Frontiers plan to overcome these challenges in the future? Well, we just focus on establishing the industry and we have one goal in mind to make it as easy as possible for people or companies to incorporate our technology either into their products or their business. And what we've done over time is of course, getting something out of the lab and into the real world requires a scale up effort. And we were successful at that. And Mercedes launched the first car with our technology in 2011. And it was a huge success. The customer reaction on that was amazing because they didn't know how this relatively expensive glass was going to sell in a $45,000 car. And the take rates for this option were off the chart, multiples of what Mercedes expected. So then they said, okay, let's put it in other vehicles because we still get the benefit. And they started to put it in the bigger, more expensive convertibles. So now they have these all glass roofs in the convertibles and people were loving that. And once again, the take rates were very high. So then they started to move it into their flagship, the S-Class. So they put it in the S-Class Coupe in 2014, the Maybach, which is their luxury vehicle in 2015, the S class 550 in 2016, the S class 450 in 2017, which are the higher volume cars. And then at the same time, McLaren started putting it in vehicles. So now we're in five different models of McLaren. And it's wow. not just the roof, we're in the windshield, we're in the side glass, we're in the rear glass. Just um, they figured out that this is great to have, but tintable glass is even better. And that's, that's why we did that. So these benefits started to permeate and then they started to migrate from the automotive market, which as you correctly noted, was our largest market to the aircraft market. So now we're in eight different models of aircraft as standard equipment and an aftermarket add-on because we're very easy to incorporate into existing aircraft on 40 different models. So we've went from cars to planes and then they realized, well, in the train market, there's a lot of glass and you have a limitation. You can only carry around so much air conditioning power in a train and still have room for the passengers. And you want your passengers comfortable within the first 30 minutes of getting in a train. And because they use so much glass in a train, the ability to cool it with the conventional air conditioning systems was really, really stretched to the limit. And if you move to environments like the Middle East, where you have very hot climates, it wasn't a half hour, it was an hour and a half to get the, the train car cool. So our glass gives you that 18 degree head start, which allows the air conditioner to actually do its job more effectively. So we went from cars to planes to trains. <laughs> and in the last year, we started to move into buildings as we scaled up production. And that goes to the other point about uh, the challenges of scaling up a nanotechnology. So we have a number of very talented companies that we've licensed to use our technology. Hitachi Chemical is one of them. A company in Israel called Gauzy not only started with one factory, but they built a second one in Germany now where they scale up and they can do a million square meters of film a year. So we've really increased the capacity to, um, to very high levels because glass is everywhere and the need is everywhere. So quick question about the, the costs of the product. So it seems like this smart glass technology, it feels like a luxury product and it seems to be used in luxury vehicles like McLaren, 
Mercedes S class, et cetera. Do you envision this smart glass being used in other cars down the line where it's, um, you know, yeah. cheaper vehicles? Yeah. yeah. So actually some of the projects that we are working on now with the automakers are mid-level cars. So, okay. uh, so this is something that we always felt could and should be accessible to a wider audience of people. And that's why we've been focusing over the years, not only on getting the technology to work as well as it does, and we're the highest performing smart glass on the planet, but also to get the cost down so that we can go into these other markets and, and you know more broadly. Cool. So without revealing any proprietary technology, could you tell us a little bit about how exactly, you know, you work with nanoparticles and composites with silicone film and everything. How exactly does your technology be able to scale up to that industry-wide manufacturing, even though it is nanoparticles? Because that is an ever-present challenge in current times. Yes. So we were probably one of the first nanotechnologies out there, although we didn't even know what the term meant when we started this, um, because it wasn't in wide scale use. And in order to get these particles to the right size and shape, we really had to focus on production processes. How do you grow these crystals to the right size and shape? And once we were able to zero in on that and identify that, then it became a matter of, okay, which companies out there had the current production capability of producing these types of materials. So we did a lot of research and this was pre-internet times even. And um, so we didn't just Google who can make, you know, SPD smart glass particles. We, you know, we really had to uh, do a lot of our own research just to find the right companies to produce it, but we did. And these are companies that are experts in pigments where you have similar types of production processes uh, or polymers or fine chemistry. And that's where we focused. And, you know, as this became a commercial success, more and more companies started to come to us saying, we'd like to do that. Matter of fact, that's how our Israeli licensee came to us, is they were already in a, if you mentioned in the interview, PDLC is a really good form of privacy class. And that's, they were, you know, really doing the best job with PDLC technology in the world. They said, but we like SPD because it's so much bigger of a market. You're shading, you're saving energy, you're putting on the outside of buildings. It's not just shower doors and you know conference room partitions. It's the entire building envelope, the skin of the building. And um, these companies started to come to us to develop businesses based on our technology too. And you know, for every company that comes to us, we turn down not you know ten of them. So you know, it's. Uh, we're very careful about who we license this to because we want to make sure that only the best companies in the world are working with the technology. And if you read our list of licensees on our smartglass.com website, you'll see it's a who's who of the glass industry, of the chemical industry, of the automotive industry. So you want to make sure that quality is always paramount. That's so intriguing. It seems like such a simple concept with applying an electric field, yeah. but it has these amazing applications. I guess I'm just wondering how it took so long in terms of like other people trying to catch up to your technology and things that, along that nature. Is it the material selection itself, the specific nanoparticles and that material combination? Well, we got lucky. <laughs> in, in respect. Um, um, nobody thought that colloidal technology like this would ever work in practice. So all of the big companies that had their own smart window initiatives in place were working on electrochromatic technology, electrochromics. We were focusing on suspended particles. And it has a very interesting background, by the way. So the first suspended particle itself was a result of a lab accident, actually. Back in the 1850s, a dog with an upset stomach was fed quinine by sulfate. And this dog urinated in the lab and <laughs> either he urinated in a tray of iodine or the scientist added iodine to the urine and discovered that these particles had formed. And 
they realized that they were very good light polarizers. And because this was a synthetic polarizer, it was cheap. Mm -hmm. So they wrote up the experiment and nothing really happened until 1935. Edwin Land, who invented instant photography for Polaroid, was looking for a cheap sunglass material because up until that point, polarized materials were things that were semi-precious materials like tourmaline and other types of things. So he came across this experiment that Dr. Herapath had done with these particles in the 1850s in England and actually duplicated it using a dog. And then he realized that when you apply an electric field to these particles, they'll line up. And he called it a light valve. The problem is he couldn't get it to work. They would work, but the particles would clump together. They'd agglomerate, they'd settle. He tried for decades. Matter of fact, Polaroid, his company, ended up becoming a licensee of ours many, many years later. So it kind of came full circle. But we got it to work. And now going back to your question about how are we able to do this, focus and determination. Was it magic? It was just, we knew this would be a very significant, you know, enabling technology for society. We wanted it to work and we really focused our efforts on it. And over the years, so when I say we got lucky, everybody else was looking elsewhere and focusing on other technologies. So when we came out with this, you know, we have hundreds of patents. There's nobody else in the world except our licensees that have any patents on this technology, this type of technology, because everybody else was ignoring it and pursuing other avenues. So we got lucky, we picked the right technology and then we worked hard to make it succeed. But in addition to getting lucky, you were also very perseverant and it just finally ended in a breakthrough, which is which is nice. But right. I'm just right. Perseverance shocked. is better than a patent. <laughs> yes. Perseverance true. is better than a patent. <laughs> I'm also just shocked. I don't know which one's worse someone adding iodine to dog urine or some, a dog <laughs> peeing in a plate with iodine already in it. Yeah. I don't know what's worse. <laughs> right. I don't know. But you know, like a lot of, like a lot of materials, think of penicillin, it was discovered by accident. So these things happen. What you do with that accident is the difference between success and failure. Yeah, that's a that's a great story. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever heard anything like that before in uh, <laughs> MSC. So definitely uh, one I'll remember. Right. Um, but yeah, that's great. That's and I great. wasn't around in the 1850s. Uh, I'm not that old. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So you've talked about a lot of great applications. So kind of what's next? We've talked to you before, but you were telling us about applications in museum where light degradation of old paintings or old artifacts is highly prevalent, which is kind of the trade-off before but between people getting to see really cool art and pers like preserving the really cool art. Right. So how can your smart glass kind of help this? Sure, David, it's a great question. The Declaration of Independence, this hugely important document is shown once every two years for about a week. The Book of Kells in Ireland is this very, very colorful old Bible. And every year they turn a page so that visible light doesn't fade all of the pages at once, okay? Visible light can be a very, very destructive force. So what we do is when you put our glass on, let's say a display case in a museum and you hook it up to a motion detector or a button, there's no light hitting that or 99 and a half percent of the light is blocked on that artifact. So you could put very, very light sensitive documents on public display for long periods of time and very little visible light is gonna destroy it. And then when someone wants to see it, you walk over to it. And either the motion detector detects that there's a visitor to the exhibit and it clears up the glass automatically. Or if you want it to be interactive, you know, with the with the uh, visitor, you, they could press a button and see it. There was a 15th century map in a museum that was being protected and very, very important uh, letters that were also very light sensitive, they were being protected. If you go to the Baseball Hall of Fame, some of the most valuable baseball cards in the world are being protected with our glass right now because visible light can be very, very damaging. So that's one area that's kind of a new emerging area. Another one is consumer electronics. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you're looking at your window and 
if you remember the movie Total Recall, the original one, um, Arnold Schwarzenegger is sitting there in his kitchen looking out the window and the wind and he's watching the news on the window. And his wife comes home and the TV goes off and it becomes a very clear window. We can do that now. Wow. So the problem with, let's say, just ta simply taking an OLED display and putting it in glass, which you can do, mm -hmm. is that you have light behind it that is going to wash out the image. So what companies like Panasonic and others now have done is they got smart. They said, okay, what if we put an SPD film on that window? When I want it to be a window, I simply make the film clear and I have a clear window. When I want it to be a TV and I want vibrant colors and high contrast, let me darken that SPD. Let me take this film and put it behind the OLED and have it block the light. And now you've turned a window into a high definition television. Or take a car. Right now, you have a nav system in your car and it's usually in a little hooded area on your dashboard. And the reason they do that is they need to protect that from glare coming in. Mm -hmm. But how many of us, myself included, don't use the nav systems in cars. We just pull out our phone and put the address in Waze or in Google Maps and we're off to the races there. Well, your phone is something that is gonna not be in the same place all the time. Mm -hmm. So how does a car designer make the screen readable so you can see what's on your nav system when it, your nav system is your phone? Mm -hmm. Well, you change your glass so that it adjusts to the lighting conditions. So now I can see what's on my screen no matter where it is in the car. Even if I put it in bright sunlight, if the glass is tinting, I could, I could see what's on it. So in a bring your own device world, you know, which is what we've moved to, this becomes very significant in terms of the human factors and driving and things like that. Wow. So would you pair it? Like how exactly would it work in terms of knowing where the phone is compared to where the sunlight is? How does that work? Well, that technology is existing right now. So Interesting. Um, it'll, it'll look where you're looking or it'll look where the sun is and it'll adjust it. So companies like Continental Automotive have created the electronics called the intelligent glass control system that they use in conjunction with our glass that for example, will tell you where the sun is. So using photo cells, if the sun is on the right side of the car, it dims the right side of the car. Um, they have a wonderful video of a car that's completely outfitted with our SPD smart glass and it's driving into a tunnel and a photo cell, as soon as it gets into the tunnel, clears up all the glass. And as soon as the driver is emerging from the tunnel, it darkens it so he's not blinded by the glare. And then the driver turns into the sun, but the sun is high on the horizon and only the top third of the sun visor darkens. But if the sun is a little bit lower, it detects where that is, and maybe the top two thirds of the sun visor will darken. Wow. So all of this is just using materials in conjunction with some thoughtful intelligence. We're the materials and then the electronics add a little bit of the brains to how you interact with it. And it's being done now. It's not science fiction. This is, you can buy cars with this now. <laughs> That's super cool. I guess just going back to the TV on a window thing, I know with 5G and higher internet speeds, the next big wave of technology instead of VR is AR, where we're gonna overlay screens in front of us. Right. Have you guys ever looked into AR with SPD as it could do the contrast sure. that's not possible today? Sure. Anytime, anytime you're trying to optimize your visuals, whether it's looking at an instrument, looking through glasses, looking through a window, you know, the ability to adjust the light to optimize that becomes super important. And that's true of AR glasses as well. Wow. So what are next steps? And because we're a simple film, and because we're a simple film, you can just, here, I'll make a visor right now right in front of my face. <laughs> Dang. Oh, that just reminded me, maybe it could be used in like visors for football helmets. Like that seems like an, another interesting application. Right. For, or motor, for or motorcycle helmets, oh, yeah, ski goggles. You know, if you're, if you're skiing down the slopes, your lighting conditions are always changing. Mm -hmm. And you don't want to stop your, your run to change the, 
you know, the right. lens on your glasses, <laughs> you know, your goggles, you could just have it automatically do it. That's so cool. So is that, is that the next step? And it's set? all done through material science. So <laughs> pursue material science, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. We support that. We support that statement. Um, but what are like the next steps that Research Frontiers is taking? Is it identifying these new applications? Is it continuously improving your technology? Continuous with... improvement. Continuous okay. improvement is key because making it even better performing. And like I said, we're the best performing smart glass on the planet, but you could always be better. Think of your first computers versus today, all continuous improvement, very important, and getting the cost more and more affordable so that more and more people could use it for more and more applications. Any lock brakes were five or 10% of the cost of a car when Mercedes first put any lock brakes on a car. Now you can't buy a car without anti-lock brakes. Even the cheapest car has them. So technology, especially automotive-based technologies where there's very high predictable volumes can come down in cost very quickly, which is one reason why we really like the automotive market is it allowed us to get our costs down you know, relatively uh, quick. That's very interesting. Uh, so I guess just to kind of summarize, like many of our listeners have a passion to use MSC to find more energy efficient solutions and in turn help the environment. What advice do you have for those who are just starting now to like strive to make an impact in this arena that you guys are having such a profound effect on? First of all, the best way to predict the future is to create it. Mm -hmm. So if you wanna be part of that future creation, you know, for me, when I was born, there weren't smart windows. When my children were born, there weren't small, smart windows. My grandchildren don't know a world that didn't have smart windows. And they love sitting in my car and adjusting the glass and saying, hey, grandpa, that's really cool, smart glass, you know. But to them, it's, it's something that is very commonplace and easy to use. If you wanna do that, if you wanna make a change in society, science and technology, especially material science, where the, it's really the frontier here, you know, can be so important. And if we take something as simple as glass, something you see every day, and we talked about the benefits, better stability of the car, better comfort, better gas mileage, better driving range. We eliminate what's called um, trucker uh, elbow. So if you look at incidence of skin cancer on the left arm of truckers, it's very high because they have their arm hanging out the window when they're driving. Well, we block those harmful radiation from coming into the vehicle. So health benefits, okay? Security, if all of a sudden my glass in my car darkens when I park it at a parking lot, people don't see if I have gifts or packages in the back seat because it's completely dark. So all of these benefits are coming from something as simple as a piece of glass having a little bit more functionality. So. If we could do it, and I'm not a scientist, by the way, but I love science, okay? If we could do it, any one of your listeners can do it too. So, you know, and the other thing I would say is if you want to create the future, don't listen to people. Um, mm -hmm. If I had a dollar for every time someone told us that what we were doing couldn't be done and it was chemically impossible and physically impossible, I wouldn't have to sell any glass. I would be <laughs> very, very wealthy. <laughs> Um, PhDs were telling us that you couldn't do what we did. And we not only did it, but we became the best selling, best performing smart glass in the world. So don't let anyone tell you, that's my best advice, that something can't be done. All they're telling you is that it hasn't been done yet or they don't know how to do it. Doesn't mean that you have to live by that. And we're certainly a living proof of that. So pursue your dream, create the future, study, be determined, <laughs> succeed and you'll be successful. <laughs> That's some great advice. I also want to ask because you have been at the same company for three decades. Like, how have you like continually like stuck with this? Like, how like when you're first starting with this, like what was like your dream and what advice would you give early entrepreneurs who may be just starting now their three decade journey to where you are now? Well, hopefully it won't take them three decades. But, <laughs> um, but, but I will say this, no matter what you do, and this is general advice for anyone going into any business or career, make sure you love it, okay? Mm -hmm. Because if you do love what you do, and I do, I mean, I wake up every morning excited, it's like you're not working. Mm -hmm. And you know, 
all of a sudden it's 10 o'clock at night and you realize that you've had such a wonderful day, but you don't realize it's 10 o'clock at night. Um, mm -hmm. Just having so much fun. I get to do some cool stuff. I've been on the test track at Mercedes. Okay. I've been at aircraft shows. I've been able to work with some of the most you know, brilliant people in the world. Some of the best automotive and aircraft engineers in the world, the best architects. I've been able to create stuff. I've been able to go and meet heads of state because of what I'm doing. Okay. So what gets me up in the morning? I love what I do. Yeah. And it shows with, you know, 29 years of, of experience as CEO. So that's really before incredible. I, by the way, before I did this, I would switch jobs every two or three years. Wow. I used to, and as a kid, I used to have a new hobby every six weeks. They used to make fun of me. So, you know, patience and, and steadfastness was not something I would have thought would be something that you judge me by. But, you know, <laughs> when you start counting the fact that those 30 years went by almost instantly for me, you know, yeah. because I have so much fun at what I'm doing and I still do. I mean, I, I can't wait for tomorrow and what I'm going to do tomorrow. Yeah, that's so inspiring. Honestly, it, it kind of translates and reminds me of this podcast and it's so awesome. It's so beneficial to be able to talk to people like you and just learn more about material science and engineering and also share it with our listeners. So David and I definitely hope we can continue this and maybe follow in your footsteps in terms of your perseverance and your continuation with this one goal and this, yeah, one dream really. Well, thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> I, I do get a lot of comfort in knowing that there's no destructive use for our technology. We only make people safer, more comfortable, more energy efficient. So I take comfort in the fact that this has been a net improvement on society. And I've had a, a small piece of that, you know, to play in that small part mm -hmm. to play in that. Right. Well, thank you so much, Joe, for joining us today. We really enjoyed having you on the show. And if any of our listeners would like to reach out to you, learn more about Smart Glass and Research Frontiers, what's the best way to do that? Best way to go is straight to our website, smartglass.com. And you'll see some really cool videos of the technology in action. It may look like science fiction, but it's real stuff that's out there and being used every day in the world. And email info at smartglass.com and you might get a response from the CEO saying, hey. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. All right, Joe, thank you so much. And uh, we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, you too. Thank you. Enjoyed being with you guys. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the It's a Material World podcast. If you enjoyed the show, consider subscribing and hitting the like button down below. If you want to meet other passionate material scientists and engineers, join our Discord community using the link in the description. If you have any feedback for us, we would love to hear it. We want to grow this show with our community's input, so comment below with your thoughts on this episode and what topics you want to see us cover next. We'll see you very soon, and in the meantime, go change the world. <laughs>